episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is your modern campaign agency dedicated to using grassroots organising to build winning campaigns and make the world a better place. When we talk about organising, uh, we're talking about uh, whether you're in business or issue-based campaigns or an organisation driving change. Uh, we develop strategies to overcome those challenges by connecting people that share all the same values and have common goals and get them to get organised and achieve those goals from the ground up. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au or on any of our socials. And welcome back to another episode of Socially Democratic. This is your number one centre-left political and cultural podcast that dives into the progressive issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. Speaking of abroad, this is our Iowa caucus breakdown special Uh, breakdown being the operative word. Uh, We're joined on today's uh, podcast by a good friend of mine. We've had him on before um, in Brooklyn, New York City, uh, Sam Schneidman, the former uh, field director for the Community Action Network and a former OFA alumni. Sam and I are going to have a chat about the Iowa caucus, what went wrong with all of the tech in reporting the results, uh, and then we're going to spend a bit of time breaking down the results that are available to us thus far. Who are the winners? Who are the losers? Who's got the mojo going into New Hampshire? And a whole lot more. So um, we hope you enjoy today's episode. We're going to do a bunch of uh, podcasts breaking down each of the major uh, caucuses and primaries for the Democratic uh, primary season. So Iowa, New Hampshire next week, South Carolina, Nevada, Super Tuesday, all the way through uh, to see who will be the Democratic nominee to take on Trump in the general at the end of this year. So here is the best place to come and find out exactly um, what is happening in the US Democratic primary system. Don't forget that the podcast is now available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher. And if you're using Apple Podcasts, please give us a rating and leave us a review. And for all the updates, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram and LinkedIn. And we're going to run polls Uh, leading into each week for our uh, US uh, special edition podcasts on our Instagram, on our Dunn Street Instagram account. So be on the lookout for that. If you're not following Dunn Street on Instagram, do so now. Um, We're going to be asking you who you think is going to win, who's your favourites, you name it. We'll be getting polls from you guys across uh, the Democratic primary season. But let's get to today's episode. Okay, we're taping this one on a Thursday lunchtime in Melbourne, Australia. It's uh, just over 48 hours since uh, the caucusing for the uh, presidential, Democratic presidential nomination process in Iowa concluded. Uh, and we got, have on the line from New York, New York, um, former field director for the Community Action Network, former um, Obama organiser um, and uh, long-time podcast uh, journeyman for Socially Democratic. You know him as well as I do, Sam Schneiderman. Welcome back to the show. It's good to be here. I've got two things to add to your intro, though. I'm, from, I'm coming to you live and direct from Brooklyn, New York, not New York, New York. <laughs> Important distinction. And... Uh, it's 48 hours after the Iowa caucuses have concluded, but we still have no idea what the final result is. Uh, it's insane, and it's completely hijacked our agenda for this particular podcast because we thought primarily what we were going to spend most of the time talking about was breaking down the results and the implications for the, all the candidates going forward into the New Hampshire primary and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to have to spend a bit of time at the start just unpacking uh, the um, the shit show that was the actual uh, uh, counting the results. Um, which yeah, I think that's the um, that's the actual technical term for it. It <laughs> is. It was a shit show. No question about it. Uh, unbelievable. So. Uh, I think what we should do beforehand, though, is maybe for the uninitiated that are not familiar with how the caucusing process works for uh, primary elections in the United States, uh, and it's very unique to states like Iowa, 
um, it would be useful to get you to basically, in, a, in the easiest way, in the simplest form, to sort of explain to the listeners out there exactly what happens uh, at the Iowa caucus. And also, it's a state that's reasonably familiar to you because you were a field organiser in 2008 for Obama, if that serves me right, in Iowa. Yeah, I definitely was. Um, however, I was in Iowa during the general election, and then I was in uh, uh, New Hampshire during the primary. But I am familiar with the state for sure. You know the turf. So talk us through how an Iowa caucus works. Well, I will we'll try not to take up the whole uh, conversation explaining this really arcane process, but I think it really um, helps to contrast it with uh, primaries. So High level, the Democratic nomination is um, done over a series of months, uh, and a, each state has a different contest. Now, it's either a primary or a, co- or a caucus. For uh, Australian listeners, a primary is actually what you are most familiar with when you think about the American-style voting system. Uh, it's a straightforward uh, vote, the popular uh, winner uh, well, the, everyone goes to the polls on a Tuesday, they vote and, um, the delegates are apportioned relative to the amount of votes that you get during that day of voting. Uh, and at a high, going back to the high level, you know, uh, delegates, uh, each state gets a certain amount of delegates that is apportioned to the various candidates throughout the process. Now, to win the process, it's not just about winning the most caucuses or primaries. It's about winning the most delegates. There's a lot of them. Uh, and so primaries are one way that's done. Now, they're either open or closed primaries, meaning that if they're open, anybody can vote in them. If they're closed, only Democrats can vote in them. So these happen in a variety of states. Most famously, uh, the first one is New Hampshire. Caucuses are a whole nother, uh, a whole nother uh, ball game, and they make zero sense. <laughs> so caucuses are the other method by which we apportion delegates. Iowa uh, goes first. So here's how it works. Uh, Iowa, like people all across Iowa will gather uh, in a location, a singular location uh, in their precinct. There is 1,681 precincts across the state, and these are typic- typically schools, churches, libraries. Uh, they're in the rural, very rural areas, it's even people's homes uh, where people meet up. So each precinct gets its own sort of like set of delegate equivalents, and those are given to candidates in proportion to the caucus goers' votes. Now, uh, it's basically like a human ca- cattle call. Imagine like the singular location, whether it's a school or a church, and all of the candidates get their own sort of uh, corner or area within this location. Also getting their its own location is an area of undecided voters. And the way that people indicate their support, unlike on a primary where people just go to the voting booth and vote for whoever they want, uh, you go and you stand in the designated area of the caucus site for that candidate forming a preference group. So if I wanted to caucus for Bernie Sanders, let's say, I would just go to the library and I'd go to Bernie's corner. Now, uh, then you have to stay there for roughly uh, 30 minutes. And during that 30 minutes, people can try and convince their neighbors to support another candidate. After that 30 minutes, uh, that electioneering is, is halted. And then we get our first round of counting. So uh, this first round of counting is really important because it establishes this really important threshold of viability. So depending on the uh, number of county delegates within each precinct, the viability threshold is 15% of caucus place attendees. So if you are a candidate and are determined to be viable at that site, you have to get 15% 
of all of the people in that room, 15% of them have to be in your corner at the end of the first round of counting. So uh, Amy Klobuchar or Andrew Yang, for example, you know, these down, these, these candidates that aren't as well known could meet the viability threshold at a smaller site if they have 15%, but not in the larger sites where it's a little bit harder to do so. So once viability is determined, participants then have roughly another 30 minutes to realign. So supporters of the viable candidates, so any candidate at that site who received 15% or more of the initial count, they're locked into their vote. They can't go anywhere. Uh, the supporters of unviable candidates may find a viable candidate to support or they can uh, leave <laughs> and abstain. So uh, this is really uh, important because it deals with preferences, which is uh, something that the Australian listeners may be a little bit more familiar with. So when the then there's a second round of counting. When that round of voting is closed, a final head count is conducted, and each precinct apportions delegates to the county uh, convention, and these numbers are reported to the state party, which can't counts the number of delegates for each candidate, and then is supposed to report it to the media. So Did that make any sense? That made, that made perfect sense. Um, well, so because it made no sense to me, and... <laughs> I'm an American citizen, so so on uh, the beginning of the second we need round, like UN monitors here oh, or something to you, help uh, us. You probably need that now uh, after uh, Monday night. So at the start of the second round, those candidates supporters that uh, did not meet the 15 percent threshold, um, they then at have, that site at that site then have an opportunity to wander around and go check out the other candidates and is there canvas is there canvassing going on by precinct captains for those particular um, viable yeah, candidates exactly. to try and recruit so each, those people each to come and support each them each campaign or candidate is able to have uh, a a person or a small group of people who will work uh, to try and win those people over interesting so on election yeah, night. So if you're into speed dating, if anyone's out there into speed dating in Australia, uh, early February every four years in the United States in Iowa is a great place to be. Good, good uh, practice. Or it's a bit like musical chairs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, on election night, once all the caucusing had finished and it was time to tally up the results and the entire United States media were awaiting these results, the Iowa caucus – sorry, the Iowa Democratic Party and announces – uh, that they were having some problems and, quote, they were having quality control issues with the count of the caucus tallies. Um, and as, as I said at the top of the podcast, even 48 hours since then, um, we still don't have a complete result. Uh, last time I checked, maybe half an hour ago, I think not, we're up to 92% of the precincts had now reported their results, but we didn't have a final result. Whereas traditionally, say in 2008, when Obama was up against a number uh, uh, Hillary and, and John Edwards, and in 2016, when Hillary was up against um, Bernie Sanders, by the end of that evening, we had a winner. Someone was up on stage, they were making a speech, and they were saying, and now we're on to... New Hampshire, 48 hours later, we don't still have a confirmed result, though we will talk about the, res the results we have thus far. And it sort of says that we can basically now make a prediction about who's going to win. But talk us through um, what is your understanding of what went wrong on the night that it enabled uh, or did not enable the, uh, the Iowa Democratic Party to announce who was the clear winner of this Iowa caucus? Do you ever have that experience as a kid where maybe your mom or your dad would tell you something that was like really glib and kind of like an aphorism and then you'd have this life experience that made you suddenly realize the wisdom behind it and you fully understood its meaning? That's my entire life right there. <laughs> well, uh, that is basically what happened here to the Democratic Party. And that adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, is uh, something that I think they learned in a really, really painful way on uh, Monday uh, night. 
So basically, the way that um, the caucuses had historically been done is all that counting would be done by you know the the party representative, and they would call their the result. They would like pick up the phone, and they after it was tabulated, they would call like the central party, report it to the party. The party would sort of collect all these numbers at once and then release them, right, all at one time. So the Iowa Democratic Party uh, is a case study this time around in mismanagement. They decided that they would no longer stick with this tried and true method, and instead they would develop this app where the uh, precinct captains or I, I forget what they're called, but the people who were in charge of counting all these votes up at the cock site would report those numbers via an app and they would no longer be required to call them in. Now they could still call them. However, it was just optional. So because this was now optional, the Iowa democratic party did not have enough staff to handle all of the phone calls that they started getting when the app inevitably malfunctioned. Uh, so people were, well, all these vote counters were realizing that this app wasn't working for them to report the results. So they tried to call the party, but because the party was understaffed, there were exorbitant wait times. We're talking 45 minutes to over an hour. And so because the Iowa caucuses are a multi-hour affair. We're talking like three hours. These people – and it was late mm. on a Monday night. These people were like, you know what? Screw this. I'm going home and I'll just call them in tomorrow. And so the Democratic Party was getting incomplete results uh, from all of their caucus sites because they had uh, put too much faith in, in this app uh, that I guess – on paper made sense, but if you actually adequately road tested it, uh, was, was never going to work. What does an app need to work? It needs the fucking internet. <laughs> Do you know how rural Iowa is in a lot of places? If there's no Wi-Fi, uh, you're going to be relying on cellular data to get on the internet. Some places it's hard to get on the internet. Some buildings don't have great reception. So uh, there, that is a key reason why um, it just totally failed. That Another thing that's also interesting is that, look, this could have worked, right? However, the Iowa Democratic Party chose a horrible vendor. Like, and these are the people – like think of a vendor as a subcontractor. So if there are any um, sort of uh, tech nerds who listen to this podcast – the caucus app, there's a great tweet by this guy, Rabble, uh, who if you want to learn more about actually the technical side of how this fucked up, you should uh, check out him. But uh, he had this great tweet where it says the caucus app is built in Firebase and React by one senior engineer who has never built a mobile app before and a bunch of people who were very recent graduates of Code Academy and who, as a couple of month ago, couple of months ago, worked as prep cooks for Starbucks and a receptionist at Regis. What's Code Academy? I think Code, Code Academy is like one of those play, like coding boot camps where if, you know you want to. You're tired of your accounting job. You can go and learn to code in like twelve weeks and get an engineering job. The Democratic vendor that you're speaking of that. Uh, produced this smartphone app uh, is a company by the name of Shadow Inc., which is the yes. I, the Ari. Also, let's talk about that for a second because look, you don't have look. You just have to be a person with a pulse who, after 2016, understands that it's not a good idea to name your political tech firm that deals with very sensitive data Shadow. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. not rocket science. They uh, – correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a report in the New York Times uh, yesterday that they are doing a bit of an investigation into who Shadow Inc. are. Uh, they're headed up by a lot of former Clinton campaigners from uh, her two failed runs at the presidency. 
And it turns out that the tech was being used by some of the major Democratic primary campaigns this time around, in particular using they developed some sort of peer-to-peer texting services. Uh, one, one particular campaign, Joe Biden's campaign, was using it, and according to the New York Times article, that they had um, ceased working with Shadow uh, late last year because the app just was uh, very, very buggy and they weren't happy with um, the service that they had been provided um, and on top of that, Nevada was scheduled to – the Nevada also have a caucus and theirs is in a couple of weeks' time. They were scheduled to use this particular app for their caucus later this month and have abandoned plans to use Shadow for their caucus and they're going to go back to the traditional method of just dialing in the results as the caucuses close. Um, and it was sort of described in the media that this was – you know, the Democratic Party had – been were sort of smarting after the 2016 general election in which the Republicans had sort of caught and surpassed them in terms of a lot of the tech side of campaigns and that this was their opportunity to sort of regain the ascendancy against the GOP. Um, but at their first attempt at it, certainly in their own internal elections, this is nothing short of embarrassing. It is not. I don't, you know, there's things are not as bad as they seem for the Democrats on the tech side, in my opinion. Um, Look, this was a very high-profile disaster, uh, but the Democrats do have some really solid technical infrastructure that they use within their campaigns. Um, One thing that I think Democrats have made really great strides on uh, is organizing tools. Um, So the strength of uh, the Democrats – uh, the Democrats' technical capabilities relies in online fundraising. So there's this uh, outfit called Act Blue that is really good with um, digital fundraising and makes it good. Uh, really helps a lot of candidates um, rack up small dollar donations. In fact, it was so good the GOP last year uh, launched their own competitor called Win Red. So they're catching up in that sense. The other area in which the Democratic Party has good software uh, is around organizing uh, with data. So there's this thing called the NGB van where uh, campaigns sort of organize the list of voters in various places, be it on a state level or a local level. Um, So those tools are good and where they're improving is – in the actual tools involved with organizing that allow people to sort of text uh, voters in an area or um, make it easier to log results when they're door knocking. Uh, So there's definitely some improvements being made there. Where I think the Democrats really um, fell behind the the Republicans is um, in digital media. The Trump campaign and the RNC were far more sophisticated in the way that they um, advertised online and the way that they targeted those advertisements. The Democrats sort of uh, lost sight of that and um, I think really underestimated the importance of digital media in 2016 as a way to sort of shape uh, opinions. Now, 2018 uh, saw a lot of technical improvement around the organizing side of things. So I think, you know, you'll continue to see strides there. Um, But uh, this was certainly a high profile disaster. The Iowa caucuses were for the for the Democratic Party. However, if I'm a Democrat, I'm not as concerned as maybe as it appears I should be because This tool, this app that they developed was superfluous in the first place. Like they didn't need it and it didn't actually matter in the turning out of votes. So I think that there's, uh, you know, it's not, the Democrats can be competitive on the technical side of things. Um, So that would be my two cents on on that. So we shouldn't read uh, too much into this uh, blimp on the um, internal uh, reporting structure that the Democrats have no, try, try no, to, I wouldn't. Uh, because again, this was something that was um, this was something that was commissioned by the Iowa Democratic Party that they paid sixty thousand dollars to for uh, to an outfit that did not know what it was doing. I'm sorry, 
but I'll be candid. If you are a competent manager who has any sort of rough understanding of how technology works, you don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to know how to code. You just have to be, um, you just have to use your common sense and understand that a 60, that, uh, something that you pay $60,000 for is not going to be what you need to handle something that sensitive. It's just not. And uh, they had a really small team. The technical background wasn't strong. It was clear that the Iowa Party, Iowa Democratic Party, didn't know what to look for uh, and didn't know what it was doing when they were and didn't have the right people in charge making these decisions at the end of the day when they were probably making the, um, you know, logical decision to try and find a uh, more efficient way of, of counting the votes. Uh, you know, in, in hindsight, it would have been just as easy just to set up a Google form and just to dr- get all the precinct captures. Well, that's to that's just... the other thing. You know, like a lot of a lot of people who work in technology are like, "What? A? Why would you fix? Why would you not like? Why would you do this in the first place?" But B, if you wanted to do it, there are so many other things that just already work and are mm-hmm. foolproof that people know how to use. The other uh, interesting little, little tidbit that came out of it was that some of the um, uh, election um, staff for the Democratic Party who were getting frustrated with the app um, were taking a photo of the instructions about the app uh, and like sort of taking a photo of it and tweeting it out, just saying, look, I'm sorry, I just I, this is not working, I don't know what to do. But on there is the actual pin number to log in for... Um, for people to put the results in. So there was a concern, there could have been a concern that if everything had been okay, um, if that pin, those pins had got out into the public arena, then uh, external parties could have actually influenced and you know, changed outcomes of local precinct results and stuff. So, um, there was Well, again, this goes back to the people who are in charge and making these decisions not knowing what they're doing. I mean, like what would, what else would you expect? Right. When you are giving no training. Yeah. No training. People have never used this before. It's a first, like, you know, it's just, it's not this, this is entirely, you know, predictable. I will say that what has been less discussed. So for the listeners in Australia, this wasn't actually, uh, a failure of the overall Democratic Party because the state party, which is sort of this sub entity that's a little bit more independent, think of it as the Victorian Labor Party uh, versus the National Labor Party. The Iowa Democratic Party was in charge of this. However, the DNC has to understand optically how much they have riding on this. Election security is so important. Uh, you ha- already have uh, a candidate whose supporters are really sensitive to, uh, you know, the uh, trustworthiness of the vote in the in the Sanders campaign, and they should have been more insistent in understanding how, you know, what sort of uh, what sort of training was being given, uh, what sort of product testing was being done. They should have insisted on some outside oversight from their own technical advisors. I don't know that this wasn't done, but the end result leads me to conclude that it was not done. Apparently the, the uh, Iowa Democratic Party held a conference call with all the with reps from all the different um, primary campaigns and it ended up in a, the DNC hanging up on them because it turned into a – descended into a screaming match between all of them accusing each other of ballot tampering and cheating. Um, which doesn't uh, bode well for the relations between all the different camps heading into New Hampshire. The other point I just wanted to make, or to get your thoughts on this, is that leading into this year's caucus, you know, folks were starting to question the appropriateness of Iowa being the first in the nation to begin the selection for the Democratic nominee to run at the general, stating that you know it, the, the the state of Iowa, with ninety two percent of the population being white, isn't actually reflective of one America or two the Democratic. Uh, coalition um, and and people were starting to say look you know should Iowa actually be the first in the nation um, what does this particular balls up do uh, to Iowa's claim to be the very first um, caucus or primary um, going forward 
Well, I think uh, before we get into that question, I think we should discuss why being first matters. Um, so the importance of being the first nominating contest on the calendar means that you get to have an outsized influence in what candidates eventually get momentum. If you're able to win the first or the second you know, nominating contest or do uh, or outperform expectations, you're then going to get media attention behind you, which powers your fundraising, uh, which helps your organizing, which makes it easier for you to um, c- consolidate support. So there's this virtuous, this virtuous loop that these early nominating contests kick in uh, in, a w- in a way that carries more influence than states further down the calendar. Um, the short answer is no, the Iowa, Iowa should not be the first state that uh, decides who the Democratic nominee is going to be. Um, there's no question that, uh, you know, its demographic makeup isn't, is not only represent, not unrepresentative of the country, but it's also unrepresentative of the Democratic base. And as the party sort of uh, expands uh, and becomes sort of the party for everyone, as frankly, the GOP just becomes a predominantly white party and an increasingly male a party that is increasingly identified with white men, uh, it's got to have a nominating process that plays more to towards its strengths and its sense of identity. Um, the other thing is that the Democrats should just move away from the caucus system at all, and they should be moving to primaries uh, full stop. Um, let's turn our attention to the results itself. Uh, and I need to stress to everyone listening uh, that we're reporting these um, where there are 92% of the precincts have reported in their results. Uh, and from the top through to the the not all the way through the bottom, but I'll read through the major ones that polled over ten percent. Um, obviously, Mayor Pete, formerly Mayor Pete uh, Buttigieg, uh, got twenty six point five percent of the vote thus far. Bernie Sanders twenty five point six percent. Elizabeth Warren eighteen point three percent. Joe Biden fifteen point nine percent, and Amy Klobuchar twelve point one percent. And in terms of pledged delegates that you were talking about at the start of the podcast, Buttigieg thus far has picked up, and there's forty one pledged delegates to be awarded to candidates. Um, uh, Pete Buttigieg has been awarded eleven pledged delegates based on the vote thus far. Same as Bernie Sanders, he's also been awarded eleven pledged delegates. Uh, Elizabeth Warren has been awarded five. Joe Biden zero, and Amy Klobuchar zero. And there are still sounds like a fucking word problem. You know, it's like make this make sense. Yeah, um, and there are still. Uh, I think the last time I checked, there was fifty-seven precincts still to report out of the sixteen hundred, and uh, Pete Buttigieg leads in sixty of them. Bernie Sanders leads in eighteen of them. But we're basically there. So I, get, I think it's fair to say, unless something drastic happens in these last couple of precincts coming in, uh, Pete Buttigieg has won the Iowa caucus. Um, do you agree? First of all, do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's looking like Pete or Bert, you know, it's, it's neck and neck. And I think, uh, Pete has sort of come out if, if he doesn't end up like fully winning, he's come out victorious in in one important respect. And that's the sense that not only was he able to establish some undeniable momentum behind his ca- campaign, he was also able to sort of blunt the mom- the momentum or the momentum of Bernie's campaign was sort of blunted by the fiasco of the slow reporting and um, confusion over over who won. Going into uh, Monday night, if uh, we didn't do a podcast beforehand, but I would have been interested to get your th- thoughts on who do you th- who you thought was going to do well and who you thought wasn't going to do well. Like my view was, I thought that. Bernie was going to win. I thought that um, Biden and Warren would have been a couple of points behind. And I kind of thought that Mayor Pete might have been a bit of a smoky. Like I wouldn't have been surprised if he had um, polled quite well. But at the same time, um, I wouldn't have been surprised if he sort of finished fourth out of that group. Um, What were your thoughts going into the um, caucus on Monday? I think pretty similar to yours. I thought Sanders was was the favorite. I thought um, 
you know, Warren could definitely be competitive given her, the strength of her ga- ground game. And then I also thought Mayor Pete was going to be really competitive as well, given the sense that he was a clear contrast from Bernie and Elizabeth Warren in a way that Elizabeth Warren was just not a clear contrast from Bernie Sanders to a lot of people. And she lost some momentum uh, with her uh, equivocation on her stance, specifically around health care. Joe Biden, Joe Biden's uh, uh, 15.9% finish, his fourth place finish, uh, is not at all surprising to me and um, is sort of what I would have expected from him, honestly. That's so I think when, when I look at this, you know, people want to be, they want to be riding the winning horse and they want to, they want to join, uh, up to the campaign that they see really has the momentum. Bernie un- unquestionably had that, uh, heading into the caucus, just in terms of, uh, the media narrative around him. Uh, and then one thing that was really interesting is that, uh, this, campaign in Iowa featured multiple campaigns that have really, really strong uh, field operations or what I guess colloquially is known as like ground games. Uh, They had a lot of organizing power behind them. They were able to sort of identify their supporters, get them, uh, turn them out and uh, really uh, compete hard for that support. You know who didn't have that is Joe Biden. And, you know, ground games, field operations are always important in any election, especially when the field is as uh, fractured as this one. And also in a contest that is uh, a, a caucus. Um, as a hundred percent, because you're you're trying to turn people out to physical locations, getting them to stay longer. You've got to keep track of who's what people's preferences are, uh, you know, um, so that that becomes really important and really only an effective ground operation can do that. I think Warren, you know, finished well, given the fact that she's sort of fallen off the pace a little bit as as a front runner um, still has uh, some delegates uh, coming out of this, which remember, you know, the nominee is not decided by total votes won, nor is it dis- decided by number of nominating contests won. It's decided by the number of delegates won in the over in the overall nominating contest. So she she's still alive in that sense. Let's quickly just run through uh, each of those four candidates and get your thoughts on on some of the aspects of the campaign, starting with uh, Mayor Pete. Um, Clearly a great result for him uh, in Iowa. Uh, when we were in Washington uh, last November with the Dunn Street engagement mission, we actually had dinner with someone uh, who was fairly high up in uh, Pete's campaign. And back then they were feeling quietly confident about their chances uh, in Iowa. Um, do you feel like this is, a, this is an underdog win for Mayor Pete? Well, I think it's underdog in the sense that, uh, you know, he – started this race with no rate name recognition. Uh, his highest level of uh, electoral achievement is winning two mayoral, or mayoral races in an Indiana town with a population of 100,000 people. He's gay and he's 37. Uh, that being said, if you had been paying attention to the core fundamentals that he had working for him, uh, I think um, it is uh, an he performed as about as well as I think uh, I expected him to perform and as well as many people who sort of follow this professionally. What can we draw from the, the, the breakdown or the analysis? And I know it's hard to do still whilst we haven't had a final result, but just looking at the, um, uh, the precincts by uh, breakdown of precincts um, across the state of Iowa, he has um, performed uh, and certainly compared to Bernie, he has performed very well in a lot of those uh, rural uh, precincts, um, uh, whereas Sanders has done well in those precincts that are centred around um, urban areas uh, and or where there are universities or colleges, so around Des Moines and Cedar Rapids, yeah. uh, Muscatani uh, County, 
uh, Jefferson County, Washington County, whereas uh, Mayor Pete, it's it's a. In the By co- the way, our our county names are just not as exciting as Wong Duty and you know the other Australian names that you guys have. <laughs> Well, they're very they spice they're, things up. They're very repetitive no. as well. Like how many can, how many Jefferson counties are there across the United States? So I, I think every state way would have too, a way we way too many. Yeah, we need some more uh, Maribyrnongs and things like that. Um, so what, how much do you uh, how much do we read into uh, his ability to win rural precincts going forward? For I mean, what, what does that what does that tell us? Uh, about Pete's campaign going into New Hampshire and then and his staying ability across um, the the calendar for the Democratic primary? So I think uh, a couple of things. Number one is um, Pete – let's start with like the, the core fundamentals that Pete had going for him. Number one, he was really good at fundraising and smart at allocating the, his resources. So he invested in – in organizing, which eventually helped him sort of build this list of supporters in rural areas. Uh, you know, for all the, for all the, hang on a minute, Sam, got, hang on, Sam, when you and I were, uh, when you were my field director in 2013, I distinctly remember someone telling us who was a um, regional MP to tell us that organizing doesn't work in regional areas. Well, I'm here from the future to tell that <laughs> regional MP back then that they are wrong. Sorry, right, continue. Um, so yeah, he's, uh, he was good at fundraising and, you know, for all, uh, the grief that he caught over that wine cave, you know, he's, he's proven good at that. Um, he presents really well. So he occupies this caricature of what people think about when they think of what a president, how a president should act traditionally. So in style, he's a very clear contrast from Trump, but he's also a very clear contrast from Bernie and Biden, who I think is not only gaff prone, but gift prone and, and, uh, also a clear contrast from Warren. Mm. Um, he saw that there was an opening for a moderate and he really leaned into it from a policy perspective and, a, a messaging perspective and his lo- his youth sort of allows him to assume enough of a hopeful message that inspires buyers people he's able to sort of you know use the vocabulary of of hope and change and a positive future um bernie's coalition has sort of coalesced it's not new bernie's not new anymore right in 2016 i think he was building a very diverse coalition that a lot of people uh found you know found sort of unexpected and it's sort of uh, concentrated into a more working class, diverse, and younger uh, group of voters. And I think going into the campaign, going into the caucus, Bernie's camp was making the argument that he could really um, build a uh, di- you know broad group of supporters in urban areas and rural areas. And what we're seeing is that you know there's some real uh, vulnerability there to that argument with Pete's performance. So, um, I think that that is sort of what we can take away from that is that, you know, Pete, that, that is the power of organizing there. Now let's also not forget that Pete got up, he's in the lead because of his performance on second preferences in the caucus system. So it's very hard to extrapolate, uh, that result and apply it to a place like New Hampshire or even South Carolina and Nevada, which are quite demographically different from Iowa. Um, And speaking of Bernie, this result, even though he came second and maybe he and his supporters might be a little bit disappointed that they didn't jag this one, um, he most likely will collect as many delegates as Buttigieg or if not, as many, maybe just a couple short, and now heads back to New Hampshire, which is his own turf. I won't say he's a native New Englander because he's obviously not, but he's uh, he is the senator for the neighbouring state. This is the uh, New Hampshire is where he uh, really launched his campaign and beat Hillary in 2016. Um, he's leading in the polls there quite considerably. He's got to feel good about his position now going into the second uh, election for this um, primary season. 
Yeah, I think this result was not bad for him for sure, but it wasn't great. I think what Bernie needs is a validating event, not so much in the minds of his supporters, but sort of in the minds of everyone else, certainly in the minds of the media. Um, One thing that was unique about Trump is that he just kept winning primary after primary, caucus after caucus, and he kept on having these validating events. No one thought Trump had any chance. People thought he was a joke back in 2016. And because he kept on having these validating events, he was able to sort of break through that and um, develop the sense of inevitability around him. So I think the certainly the confusion around the results takes momentum from Bernie. Uh, but it sort of also argument undermines his ar- core argument that he can – bring enough new people into the process that he's going to beat Trump because turnout was, was not as high as, as we were expecting. Now, uh, I think Bernie is going to need, you know, winning New Hampshire is certainly good, but I think what you'll hear if he wins New Hampshire, a lot of media, certainly like cable news pundits are going to be like, well, he's the, you know, the senator from the neighboring state, of course he's going to win. And, you know, he's got, he's been around for a long time, has, you know, is very popular. Of course he's going to win. I think for him to really be seen as an inevitable candidate, as the inevitable nominee that people will get behind, it's not just going to be New Hampshire that seals it for him. He's got to sort of win in South Carolina and Nevada by convincing margins. And then he's got to really clean up on the contest of super Tuesday in a way that catches people's attention again. And by people, I mean the, the, the pundits, the media, the, the last, the last time you and I uh, spoke face to face in, uh, in Brooklyn last November, we really talked about Warren a lot and how impressive both her and her campaign was looking uh, she was doing very, very well in the polls. She had a gr- the perception of her campaign was that it was she was running a very good outfit. She had a very good ground game, uh, very good at fundraising. Um, was strong on policy. Uh, then she sort of you know took some rough hits in some of those debates, and you sort of mentioned it before, certainly around her healthcare plan. Um, and she's really started to uh, drop off. Um, but uh, is this a surprise? Her, I feel that this has been a surprise result for her. I mean, she's finished ahead of Joe Biden, albeit only by, at this stage anyway, three points, but she's picked up five uh, pledged delegates, five more than Joe Biden has thus, thus far. So is, is this a good result for her going into New Hampshire? Well, it's not great, and it's not looking great for her chances to win the nomination She's still alive, you know. She's won delegates, and you know that certainly is what matters. But you know, uh, the, these things are about a couple. You know, elections are about a couple of things at this level. Number one, you know, it is there is an element of of it that is about momentum, and she was really strong out of the gate, uh, defining a clear vision of what she wanted to do. People were really attracted to that. She was great at uh, raising money and uh, was able to sort of build a strong base of support, built a strong campaign organization of really talented organizers and was doing quite well because she had that clarity of vision of what she wanted to do as president. I think things really sort of hit hard for her when she – equivocated on her stance around health care or if you don't want to agree that she equivocated certainly she uh, dropped the clarity uh, that she had around that issue that she dropped the clarity that sort of defined her candidacy certainly around that issue um, so I think that's where she really sort of began to slip with her support and in addition to momentum another dynamic that is at play in campaigns at this level is um, consolidation. In a crowded field, you got to get out early to define yourself, what you're all about and what your vision is to 
help consolidate that support, build that base of support, and then consolidate it over time. Because uh, this race is full of so many different candidates uh, who are basically offering a populist progressive vision and a more moderate status quo vision, uh, there's really only room at the top for one, maybe two voices for each respective vision the closer you get to election day. So as uh, Elizabeth Warren started losing support, Bernie obviously stepped up and performed as people expected him to. As uh, Biden became uh, you know, reverted back to being old Joe and really uh, did not do well on the campaign trail, Pete really seized that opportunity and I think has established himself as the other front runner. So I think that will explain um, Elizabeth Warren's disappointing result. I think it's a dispiriting result um, if we're just going to be blunt about it. Uh, she has delegates. She's alive. You know, there's a lot more contests to come. She's got an impressive organization, but um, I, I, I think she's really got to oh, perform well in New Hampshire in a way that I think catches people's keep, catches people by surprise. Uh, and then you know she's going to have to perform really well on the um, the Super Tuesday states as well to make up for the delegates that she's behind. The thing that I'm trying to rack in my brain at the moment is, um, you know, the three main moderates that are running in this contest are Biden, Klobuchar and Buttigieg. Um, there's enough evidence to tell us thus far, certainly out of polling, that Joe Biden is the strongest candidate, uh, according to polling, amongst the African-American uh voting bloc within the Democratic Party. The first big test of that won't be New Hampshire, but it will be uh, a week later in South Carolina. If Joe Biden struggles in New Hampshire as well, uh, and the polls now are starting to... We'll talk a little bit about that um, in a moment. Um, it struggles in New Hampshire as well. Is his campaign terminal going into the South Carolina primary? And if that is the case... And we've already heard enough criticism of Buttigieg's campaign saying that uh, he is uh, he is not attracting uh, African American voters to his to his voting block. If you're an African American voter and you get and it's time to vote in South Carolina, and uh, Joe Biden's campaign is almost terminal because he's had two bad results in a row, do people all of a sudden do African Americans go? No, no, I'll stick with Joe. And I'll come out and vote for him. And all of a sudden, Joe wins South Carolina, and that gives him a bit of impetus going into Super Tuesday. And his campaign's back on the back on the on the road. Or do moderate moderate voters, in particular African American voters, who have been regarded as being quite pragmatic with their voting, do they jump onto Mayor Pete because he's seen as the other moderate, or I, or do yeah. they go to Bernie, no. or what do they do? Where what, what what are we thinking here? Uh, so I'm reluctant to to speak of you know. Af like African American voters is some sort of like monolithic voting block. Yeah, yeah, I'll take that forward. I understand. You, you know, uh, I think what's going to end up happening is you know no one's no one's expecting uh, Pete to, or excuse me, no one's expecting Joe Biden to to really do all that well in New Hampshire. If he he's got to win South Carolina, he's just got to do it. Um, and if he doesn't do that, I think really what you're going to see is that Pete is going to become, uh, you know, the other inevitable front runner, you know, uh, compared to Bernie and, um, you know, these campaigns are long. It's really hard to tell what's going to happen beyond the first three or four states, how the dynamics change, how uh, party leaders and activists coalesce around particular candidates. So I'm going to I'm going to like I'm not going to necessarily cop out, but I am going to withhold judgment of, you know, about prognosticating too far in the future. Soft. OK, well, <laughs> 
one. It just it, it would be making like uh, a prediction that is, that is somewhat meaningless, just because these dynamics are going to change so much. Yeah. But if if Joe Biden does not win in New Hampshire, I think you're going to see a lot of people who had their hopes pinned to Biden as the best person to beat Trump are going to start putting that on uh, Pete. Mm. Definitely not putting it on Bernie. Interesting. Let's talk about uh, – actually, no, one more question before we move on to just doing some uh, analysis of New Hampshire. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on whether turnout was higher or lower for this caucus. Um, you say – you said before you thought it was lower. Um, well, it, it underperformed expectations. So I think Democrats were really uh, counting on this um, surge of enthusiasm that voters have heading into 2020 and like defeating Trump. And they expected 2008 levels of turnout for the Iowa caucuses. Uh, they just didn't get that. Um, it was on par with 2016. And I think that uh, is not the best sign for the party overall. It's also not, hor- you know, it's not the worst. We'll get into that in, in a second. But who it's really not good for is Bernie Sanders because his argument has always been, I can bring new people into the voting process. And for him to win on his vision, he's got to be able to expand the electorate. Uh, what turnout levels in uh, the caucuses, the Iowa caucuses on Monday, did not indicate that he was delivering on that. They also indicated that not every other candidate was – no other candidate was was inspiring – uh, you know, sort of like record levels of turnout or signaling that they were getting, um, you know, surge indicating enthusiasm. Hmm. So the reason why, even though this is not the best sign for Democrats, the reason why it's not horrible is because, look, caucuses are a bad process. They require, they require hours of time. Uh, this could be unrepresentative of the rest of the country. Um, but it's certainly not good for anyone's electability case. And I think it's also a sign of how damaged the party's brand is. You know, not many people are attracted to it right now. Not as many as, as the Democrats hope. Uh, and they've got some real issues there. Mm. Let's turn to New Hampshire. Uh, which is the first primary of the season. It's next Tuesday. Uh, two most recent polls that have come out, the Emerson College poll has Sanders on 32%, Buttigieg on 17 Biden on 13 Warren Klobuchar on 11 each, and the Suffolk University poll, which was conducted over the 3rd and 4th of this month, has got Sanders on 24, so not as much, Buttigieg on 15, uh, Biden on 15, and Warren on 10. Um, going to this one, how do you, what, what are your thoughts about who's, who's going to surprise us and who's going to struggle? Well, I, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I don't think that Biden is going to perform well here. Uh, and the reason I don't is because similar dynamics are at play as in Iowa, where it comes down to organize, organizing. Uh, it's still a really crowded field in New Hampshire as it was in Iowa. And you have a lot of candidates who have been on the ground for a really long time there who have poured in insane amounts of resources, millions and millions of dollars into organizing that state. And it's a relatively small state. Uh, so it's harder to bring new people in. And Joe Biden was never going to be uh, an electorate expanding primary candidate. So he's, I think, going to be in real trouble coming away from this campaign. It will be interesting to me um, how the myth of the neighbor plays out. Bernie Sanders is often, you know, everyone knows that he's the senator from the neighboring state in Vermont. So is Elizabeth Warren, Massachusetts borders New Hampshire. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how that works for her. Uh, and then I'm also curious to see um, what Pete's performance is going to be like there and whether sort of uh, turnout uh, is going to mirror Iowa and if he's going to be able to uh, build, you know, what sort of coalition is he building? Because it's clear that Bernie is building a coalition. 
if he's not of a diverse set of voters, even if he's not necessarily expanding the electorate at the rate we may be expected. So I think that is something I'm going to be really watching out for, too. Uh, and then I think one thing that I'm also going to be looking at is how does Amy Klobuchar perform? Because she's certainly overperformed at people's expectations in Iowa. And if she's able to do that again in New Hampshire, it will prove that she has staying power and uh, therefore some political weight behind her that she can wield within the nominating process. Mm. No one expects her to be the nominee. But that does allow her to play spoiler a little bit and sort of influence the outcome uh, at least, uh, you know, more than anybody expected. The longer that uh, moderate candidates like Buttigieg, Biden and Klobuchar all remain in this contest, that certainly has to help the um, Sanders campaign. Certainly. It helps them, definitely. Uh, But... You know, because it helps, it allows him to continue to contrast his vision from the other three and allows him to sort of continue to sort of to organize his base and build his coalition that is very uh, that that uh, is clear. And uh, while Pete and Joe Biden and Klobuchar continue to battle over uh, over their own sort of coalition. But I think um, Pete's message, if, I'm, if I think of anything, anything that I'm most confident in when it comes to New Hampshire, Pete's message is going to become about inevitability, where you know he's going to say, "Look, Bernie Sanders is clearly popular. However, he's just he can't beat Trump. He's not going to win." And clearly, Joe Biden and Amy Klobuchar can't win the nomination. I'm the only guy who can stop Bernie. And I think that is where you're going to see uh, see his campaign go politically. If you could choose to be the campaign manager of any of the campaigns right now, which one would you jump on right now based on not your favorability towards the candidate, but simply momentum and feeling good about where you are right now? Well, I think there's a lot to be... If if I'm a Pete supporter, like if I'm Pete, there's a lot to be uh, um, optimistic about. Certainly, you've got a candidate who just knows how to handle himself and knows what he's doing. I know a lot of people think that he's a bit of a robot, but clearly he's not going to go go off and and make rash decisions. He's going to let his team do his thing, do its thing. Uh, and you know, he's going to stick to being the candidate, which I think is really, really important. Um, and, uh, contrast with Joe Biden, who has started to micromanage his campaign and sort of ask why he's ask his campaign staff, why he's not doing well and has created sort of like a bad culture within his campaign, to be honest with you. So, uh, there's a lot to be optimistic about with Pete and, you know, I'd be pretty, pretty curious about that. Uh, Bernie, there's a lot to be excited about. Um, I think I would find it really challenging, uh, if I were on the Sanders campaign to chart the path, not to the nomination necessarily, but to that general election victory. And can you build that coalition by expanding the electorate enough? Hmm. Um, that is going to be, uh, something that is, uh, is interesting to me. I like and uh, the more and more I read about um, Pete Buttigieg, he reminds me of just the traditional Labor state premier that we've had over the years across the country. Just someone who is a safe pair of hands and doesn't particularly like hanging out with people. That's what Pete Buttigieg seems to be to me. Yeah, absolutely. He's not, I, like I said, you know, Bernie is absolutely a contrast from Trump. If you hate Trump, Bernie is clearly not him. However, Bernie, for I think as good as his vision is, it is not uh, something that a lot of people are – well, it's not, it's not something that is conventionally comfortable to uh, a lot of people. And that's – when I speak about Bernie needing a validating experience or series of experiences, it's being able to prove – that people are comfortable enough with his vision that they want to see him as president. 
and Pete is able to sort of have, um, you know, uh, a, you know, is able to argue that he is progressive enough, uh, but also certainly presents as competent enough to be that contrast from Trump. Well, we are all going to find out in a week's time when uh, we uh, watch the results, hopefully coming quite quickly for the New Hampshire um, primary. We did a poll uh, on the Dunn Street Instagram account in the 24 hours leading up to the recording of today's podcast. And one of the questions we asked was, um, all the people who follow Dunn Street, who do you want to win the nomination? And the results are in, so I'm going to let people know. Uh, 9% of you said that you wanted Uncle Joe Biden to win the nomination for the Democratic Party. 18% said Bernie Sanders uh, 21% said Senator Warren and a whopping 50% of those who responded to the poll want Pete Buttigieg. So there you go. Um, we uh, got to leave a big th- sample size. Oh, massive sample size. Yeah, over, just, oh, just kidding. <laughs> over 3,000. Over 3,000. Very small margin of error. Um, uh, well, one thing I think that's important to note here uh, heading into New Hampshire is that Australians it's not vote. just – it's just not it's not just about who wins New Hampshire. It's about who outperforms expectations in New Hampshire. Uh, in 1992, you know, Bill Clinton was on the brink of losing it all, you know, heading into New Hampshire. Uh, he had all those like allegations against him that we are all very familiar with. And he not only did he not finish first. He did not finish second. He finished third, but he finished a convincing third in a way that was sort of resurgent and indicated that he had momentum on his side. So It's arguably um, one of the greatest third places in the history of politics. Oh, man. It's the only time third place has been first. (laughs) So if you're looking at – if you're looking at who's going to, you know – win this thing just keep in mind how important momentum is uh in this overall nominating contest absolutely and sam will you join us for uh a analysis uh post the new hampshire primary next week depends on how much you pay me (laughs) but i'm interested oh you're interested (laughs) you're interested okay well (laughs) In that case, I look forward to uh, speaking with you again next week. Thank you very much for your time today. We do appreciate uh, you taking your busy, knocking out, you know, an hour out of your busy Brooklyn hipster schedule to come and talk to us on the podcast today. I've got some fixes to fix. I'm sure sure you do. Um, And uh, we'll talk to you next week with uh, a breakdown of the New Hampshire primary. Awesome. Can't wait. 